right, everyone. Well, welcome once again. And let's open up in a word of prayer. Father God, thank you for this time. Thank we can be together. We ask your blessing on, uh, on our study. We ask for your illumination, Lord. Pray for your anointing. In Yeshua's name, amen. Oh, hallelujah. Great to be back with you all. And once again, for first time, there's a special welcome. And um, I hope you're hungry for God's word. I am. Um, as we go through the Parashat Shavua, for those of you who are new here, we've been, we started at Genesis 1-1 about four weeks ago. And we're going right through the Pentateuch or the Torah. And we're going to finish at, uh, at Deuteronomy, the end of Deuteronomy. And it's an annual cycle. And it's, it's, guys, it's all about walking with the Lord. It's all about uh, learning new things about who God is, who we are, and more about his creation. And it doesn't matter how many cycles we go around, we'll never stop learning. And even, even that theme in itself, cycles, we talked about that about two months ago in the Jewish world. The, the Jewish world is filled with cycles, cycles of life, as it mentions in, uh, in the book of Ecclesiastes. To everything, there is, an, there is a time and a purpose under heaven. And um, whatever cycle we're in, it, the idea is not to run away from it, not to deny it, not to fight it, but to try and learn what God wants to teach us in that cycle, um, whether it's a cycle of loss, whether it's a cycle of success, whether it's a cycle of loneliness, whether it's a cycle of suffering, whether it's a cycle of being persecuted, whether it's a cycle of promotion, whether it's a cycle of wrestling, whether it's a cycle of being in the desert, whether it's a cycle of being confused. All of these are uh, cycles that come our way. We don't look for them most of the time. They come our way. And we find ourselves in the whirlwind like Job. And we're like on a cloud like Job. Fly. He doesn't know where he's going to fall. Uh, but uh, he didn't know. But the Lord was there with him. And of course, we need not fear the, the, the devil because in that story of Job and in Luke 22, when the Lord said, Simon, Simon, Satan has asked to sift you as wheat. You'll notice that in both of those stories. And by the way, when the Lord was making that statement, Simon, Simon, Satan has asked to sift you as wheat. In my understanding, that is a direct reference to the book of Job. Because that is the story in the Old Testament that uh, Satan uh, came to the Lord. And notice in both circumstances, the, 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 the Satan had to ask permission from the Lord. And that should give us a lot of confidence. Doesn't matter what comes our way, whether it is from the devil or not. Uh, God, he is the Lord. He's not the Lord of evil, but he's the Lord over all evil. So who cares what comes our way? God, I want to learn what I need to learn in this season of life. Give your servant a wise and understanding heart. Well, uh, we started off last week where the Lord called Abraham out of the Ur of the Chaldeans. Was it last week? I think it was last week. Genesis 12, I think so. Uh, yeah, lech lecha. Get out, yeah, get out of your people, out of your country. And for those who weren't with us, the words lech lecha, literally in Hebrew, in English we say, get out of your country. But in the Hebrew, it's actually, uh, go forth for you. It's really hard to, translate into English but to paraphrase it it's almost like the Lord is saying 
Abraham, for your sake, get out. Get out of your home, your country, your people. I want you to uh, distach yourself from all that, all the negativity, and I want you to, uh, I want you to find yourself in a new setting, in a new way. I want you to uh, come to self-discovery away from that uh, background. And, um, you know, it w- I think it would have been a real challenge for Abraham to do that. Just like when Moses, um, remember, Moses had three main periods in his life. The first 40 years was in Egypt, where he was a big somebody. Then the next 40 years is when he was absolutely a no one. He probably had to rediscover himself coming from being uh, in the, the palace of, uh, of Potiphar to being out in the desert. Um, you know, quite a, a radical change. And um, so... The, the, the new self-discovery, life has a way of throwing things at you where we, we, we second uh, guess at our own, are we living up to our own convictions? And, um, you know, we, we have to sometimes deal with that animalistic nature that sometimes rises up. And I just gave a, that same story that I've used before. Uh, remember that story of Ali Wiesel, who uh, was asked what was his worst time in the history of uh, the Holocaust? What was his worst memory? And he said that the worst memory is the day that we were all, I was there with my father and I was a young man and we all had our tiny little ration of bread and we were so hungry. The hunger was so painful uh, the, sorry, the, the hunger was so uh, deep, it was actually painful. And uh, I had my piece of bread, I ate it. And then he said, I looked over and I saw my father with his piece of bread. And he said, this was my worst memory in the whole of the Holocaust. It was when I looked over my father with, with his piece of bread and I wish my father would die. And he said, that's how hungry I was. And he said, that's what the Holocaust and that's what uh, sometimes suffering in life can do to you. It brings out that evil or that animalistic nature. So uh, Abraham is out. He's in the new land, this land that was promised to him. And remember last week I gave the analogy of you know, it's as almost like the Lord said to him, Abraham, get out. Um, I want, here's a ticket to a plane. And Abraham's saying, well, where am I flying to? And God is saying, I'm not going to tell you where you're flying to. But when you get to the next spot, I'll give you new instructions. So Abraham gets on a plane, doesn't know where he's going. He arrives and then he, 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 uh, he sets out up his tent and then it's time for him to move on again. Okay, God, where am I going now? No, I'm not going to tell you where you're going. Just get, here's a ticket, get on the next plane and, uh, and go and so on and so on and so on. What an interesting walk. What an interesting life. It, it, this is the life of faith, everyone. This is what we are called to. Now, this week, we're going to look at a little bit deeper the relationship with uh, Abraham and the Lord, and we're going to look at some of his testings. And uh, can I just one more thing before we go into our text? Uh, it's a reminder of our first study in the book of Genesis, and it's the 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 reminder that in the book of Genesis there were two creation stories. The one creation story is the word Elohim, which is the general word God. And it talks about how he created the heavens and the earth and the the moon, the stars, uh, the the waters. He separated the waters. It seems a very aloof God way out in the heavens. 
the next uh, chapter, chapter two, which is a different story of creation, it talks about a, it gives a very different kind of narrative. It talks about, firstly, uh, a different name of God, the, the name uh, Yahweh, which is a very personal name. And then it's a, it talks about a God who was walking in the garden with Adam. So from a very uh, way up in the clouds, God, to a very personal God. It's that kind of that, fr that uh, uh, tension there that we have in the scriptures and that you and I sometimes have. There's, there's a high holy God, and yet there is a God who dwells with, uh, with mankind. And here we're going to look at uh, him dwelling with Abraham. So Genesis chapter 18. Um, page one, and the Lord appeared, and that's the name of our parasha, uh, Yir A. That's the name, Yir A in Hebrew. It, and the Lord appeared unto him in the plains of Mamre, and he sat in the tent door in the heat of the day, and the Lord appeared unto him. So, just a few comments about that. Uh, number one, it doesn't say the Lord appeared unto Abraham. It says the Lord appeared unto him. Okay. And I don't know whether there is a, is a deeper meaning in that or not. But um, uh, I, I read some commentary saying that the fact that it doesn't say to Abraham personally, it kind of, it's like sowing a seed that it's for anyone that the Lord decides to appear to. But in any event, the interesting thing is that it says it was in the tent door in the heat of the day, okay? In the deserts of, uh, of this part of the world, it is extremely wickedly hot, okay? That time of the day and the heat of the day, you know, you're, you're just pretty drained and you get this visitation not sure why the lord decided to appear at that uh moment but that is a, an interesting thought about this whole verse and about our life because we don't get a picture in the bible that the lord appeared to abraham or anyone every five minutes of their lives or every five days or every five weeks or every five months. We don't get that. We don't get that uh, the great men in the Bible were hearing God's voice every five minutes or that often. The, the general picture we get of a, of a man or a woman of God is that they were either a tent dweller or a shepherd or a nomad. And once in a blue moon, the Lord appeared unto them. What we've got to do is we've got to read between the lines. What did they do most of the time? And we see what they did most of the time. They were either shepherds or tent dwellers. Or look what happens at verse 2. And he lift up his eyes and looked. And lo, three men stood by him. And when he saw them, look at, look at his response, everyone. He ran to meet them from the tent door and bowed himself toward the ground and said, my Lord, if now I have found favor in thy sight, pass not away, I pray thee, from thy servant. Let a little water, I pray you, be fetched and wash your feet and rest yourselves under the tree. And I will fetch a morsel of bread and comfort your hearts. After that, you shall pass on. For therefore, are you come to your servant? And they said, so do, as thou hast said. And, Ab and look what verse 6 says. And Abraham hastened into the tent unto Sarah and said, make ready quickly three measures of fine meal. Knead it and make cakes upon the earth. And Abraham ran to the herd and fetched a calf tender and good and gave it unto a young man and he hastened hasted to dress it and he took butter and milk and the calf which he had dressed and set it before them and he stood by them under the tree and they did eat so 
it's quite an interesting basic story, nothing major, but there's a lot to learn from this. And one of the things is we don't see a, an old uh, crippled or old man Abraham here, quite the opposite. We see a vibrant, energetic servant Abraham. And by the way, this is why he is considered the father of the three monotheistic main religions of the world, Islam, Christianity, and Judaism, because of his real servant heart. And we see it here, his attitude, his spirit, the occasion arose. What kind of occasion? Just to serve people, a little bit of bread, a little bit of water. He could have been quite um, half-hearted about it. He could have thought, oh, I'm tired. It's hot. I got no energy. Why are these people, why are they bugging me at this time of the day? But no, it seems that he did it with all of his heart, with all of his soul. And this is why Abraham is called the, the father of faith and, or, or the father of hospitality. And um, uh, notice in verse eight, by the way, it says he took butter and milk and the calf, which he addressed and set it before them, which is a, kind of a controversial verse because you know that Jewish people, they don't have milk and meat together in the same set, setting, right? Remember when you stayed in hotels in Israel, the, the dinners were dairy, were, were meat-based and the breakfasts were always dairy-based. But this is an interesting verse and I'm not too sure how uh, the rabbis get around it. But in any event, um, uh, what an incredible, I don't, wanna, uh, I don't want to deify Abraham here and make it um, bigger than it was. But really, guys, a small little servant job as getting some bread, getting some water, uh, it just seems that the author is including the story for a reason. And the rabbis, they, they rave about the, the servant heart of Abraham based on this passage. So I, I don't think I need to say more. Of course, it wasn't just uh, Abraham, as, uh, as Ter uh, Teresa has just put in the, the notes. It was or someone else, I can't remember, uh, quite read it. It was Sarah as well. God forbid that I should leave out Sarah in this. It was combined effort, but the point is they had a servant heart, a servant spirit, and uh, we don't know the effects and the, the witness that we are bringing on people that we are servant by a kind, a tiny little bit of servitude. We don't know how it can affect people's lives, even people's destinies. So um, now, these men that have come to Abraham, they have come to kind of warn him a little bit because the context of what's going on, everyone, is the story of Sodom and Gomorrah, a lot of evil going on. In verse 20 of chapter 18, the Lord said, now he's speaking. He's now speaking to Abraham. It starts off, he appeared unto Abraham. By the way, what does that mean, everyone? He appeared to Abraham. Did he physically appear? Doesn't seem in the story that he physically appeared to Abraham, does it? So why? Why, and, and by the way, the word vayire appeared gives the impression that it was a physical appearance, but it wasn't. So what does it mean? He appeared unto Abraham, okay? It, it's really, in a way, it, it, it's trying to uh, portray God coming to him, you know, in a way that Abraham could almost see with his spiritual eyes okay there are many senses that we have sometimes we we are oh, i see sometimes ah 
I understand or ah, I hear what you're saying. Sometimes we use those different expressions depending on, you know, what, what, uh, from what angle we're, we're getting the point. Have you ever thought about that? The difference when we say, oh, I see what you're saying, or I hear what you're saying, or yeah, I understand what you're saying. Why do we make those different statements? Why don't we say the same every time? Because we perceive it at different levels of our soul. There's the, 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 the seeing, the spiritual eye seeing. There is the, the spiritual hearing. And then there is the spiritual understanding level. Um, and now in verse 20, the Lord said. Because the cry of, of Sodom and Gomorrah is great. And because their sin is grievous. By the way, let's let's uh, let's not overlook that that uh, phrase. Because the cry of Sodom and Gomorrah is great. Well, hang on. How can the what does it mean? The cry of Sodom and Gomorrah. Remember, there were no righteous people. Actually, that's that's wrong. We know there were. There, there weren't any more than 10 righteous people, okay? There might have been actually nine or eight or seven or six or five or four or three or two or one. There might have been. Abraham stopped at 10. But, so we know that there were not more than 10 righteous people. So, uh, you know, where it says, because the cry of Sodom and Gomorrah is great and because their sin is very grievous, look what it says in verse 21. I will go down now. And see where and see whether they have done all together according to the cry of it, which has come unto me. And if not, I will know. So this cry, what was this cry of Sodom and Gomorrah? Maybe even though there were mostly unrighteous people, it seems to me that the wicked were inflicting other wicked people. It was so corrupt. It was so evil. Verse 22, and the men turned their faces from thence and went towards Sodom. These are the three men. But Abraham stood yet before the Lord. A very wise move from Abraham. Notice how he wasn't tempted to go. He, he was in a safe place and he stood before the Lord. Now, notice some of the phrases that the writer is using. Look at verse 21. I will go down. Now, does that mean that God is up there and he doesn't see what's going on? Or verse 22. But Abraham stood yet before the Lord. So what? He wasn't before the Lord before? What are these phrases, everyone? I think these are these. this is what's called um, uh, biblical... Uh, uh, this is the study of biblical literature and really trying to deeply uh, study what the author's intent, uh, what's he trying to do, what kind of imagery he's trying to use. And obviously, he's using very humanistic, not humanistic, human terms to help us understand how God wants to intervene and how God does intervene with mankind. I will go down now. Of course, God's on the earth already, but it's a way of, of the author showing that God is making a beeline, like a, 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 a zoom, zooming in on the situation. And Abraham, it says, but Abraham stood yet. The Abraham odenu omed lifnei Adonai. He, it, it, it's a, um, a, uh, a, what's the word I'm looking for? He made a, um, a decisive decision that he is going to stand and wait before the Lord to see what is going to happen. Okay. These little phrases are important. They're highlighting what's really going on in the story. And I think 
as the picture, as we get on into the study, we'll see more and hopefully it will reflect in the relationship that Abraham with the Lord and hopefully we'll see something about our relationship with the Lord as well. Now, we're going to see the next point in the middle of page two, or if you've got your notes, God's unwavering faithfulness to Abraham and to his seed. Look what it says. This is before the Lord is about to destroy Ab uh, Sodom and Gomorrah. Look at verse 17. And the Lord said, shall I hide from Abraham that thing which I do? Seeing that Abraham shall surely become a great and mighty nation, and all the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him. For I know him, that he will command his children and his household after him. And they shall keep the way of the Lord to do justice and judgment, that the Lord may bring upon Abraham that which he has spoken of him. Remember, everyone, the name Avram and Avraham are really important to his destiny. Remember, names in the Bible weren't just random. They were usually prophetic, and they were for that person's destiny and calling. And he was going to be, uh, he, he, he was uh, an exalted father, and then he would become a father of a multitude. And something that I mentioned last week, where did he get this from? The fact that he was created in the image of God, that God put that creative energy into Abraham to be the man that he, he, he was. And the same with you and I. You and I have different greatnesses. We, we all, every one of us has an amazing greatness. Okay? We shouldn't be jealous of anyone. Once we tap into our own greatness, and I, and I don't use that greatness in a humanistic or in a very proud way. You, you know what I'm trying to say, everyone. I'm trying to say that when we look at God's creating, creation story, when it says in, in Genesis 2-7, he breathed his spirit into Adam and he became a living soul. You know, Judaism teaches that within Adam's soul, there was an incredible creative power, okay? And so much so that the Lord brought the animals to Adam, Adam studied the animals, and he gave them all names, appropriate names, prophetic names on these animals. Where did he get that creative ability? God put it in him. Adam wasn't a puppet because it says, he, God brought the animals to him to see what he would name them. And whatever he did name them, that's what they were. So God gives us this incredible energy and power. For Abraham, look at the energy that he had to serve. Now, you may think, okay, big deal, serving someone a piece of bread, a cup of water. If you look at that, in a, in a lowly state, I, I think you're getting it wrong, everyone. Because what you're doing is you're judging it to other things in life. Don't look at it that way. Look at it that that was the occasion that arose for Abraham to serve a little bit of bread, to, uh, to serve a cup of water. For Abraham, that was the most important thing in the world for him right at that moment. And if we approach uh, the things that uh, uh, open for us, we're going to be world changers, right? That's the thing that's going to turn the world around. And it's going to start in the home. It's going to start when we, we serve our, 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 our spouses, our partners, our children, guests that come in. They are the things that are going to change the world and affect people's lives. But if we wait for the big things, I think that's a wrong attitude. So, um, and the proof of what I'm saying is in the verses that we just read. God is about to destroy civilization because it had become so corrupt. But then before he does, he takes Abraham and he, uh, 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 it actually doesn't say he took Abraham aside. Look at verse 17. And the Lord said, 
shall I hide from Abraham that which I do? Seeing that Abraham shall surely become a great and mighty nation, and all the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him. For I know him, that he will command his children and his household after him, and they shall keep the way of the Lord to do justice and judgment, that the Lord may bring upon Abraham that which he has spoken of him. And remember, last week, Genesis 12, God called Abraham and said, I will bless you, and you will be a blessing. See, Abraham had the blessing of the Lord over his life, just like every one of us who is a man or a woman of faith. Remember, Abraham believed God, and his faith was accredited to him as righteousness. So we, we open up the door of blessing. The blessing is there. We open the door for that blessing by our faith. Faith and rest, everyone. Not faith and works. Works do come later. But faith and rest, that's the first door. The rest follows on from there. Okay, the, now we get to Abraham's prayer life. Okay. And, and all of this is coming together. The, the picture is being painted everywhere. This is just uh, some key points in the life of Abraham. In chapter, uh, we're still in chapter 18, verse 23. And Abraham drew near. Notice the writer uses these very poignant phrases. Abraham drew near and said, Will thou destroy the righteous with the wicked? Peradventure there be 50 righteous within the city. Will thou... <coughs> <clears throat> also destroy and not spare the place for the 50 righteous that are in it. Uh, and and we, I don't want to read every verse here, everyone, but you know the story that the Lord, uh, uh, look what verse 26 says, the Lord said, if I find in Sodom 50 righteous within it, then I'll spare all the place for their sakes. And then in verse 27, Abraham, look how he says, Behold, now I have taken upon me to speak unto the Lord, which am but dust and ashes. Uh, peradventure there shall lack five of the 50. Meaning, what if there's only 45? And then he goes down to 40. And then he goes down to 30. And then 20. And then 10. And, um, and look at verse 32. He said, Oh, let not the Lord be angry, and I'll speak yet this but once. Peradventure 10 shall be found there. And he said, I will not destroy it for 10's sake. And look what it says, verse 33. And the Lord went his way as soon as he had left communing with Abraham. And Abraham returned unto his place. Again, you've got this very almost, it's almost like a man and a woman or two friends meeting. The, the kind of uh, literature, the kind of writing, the writer, the author is deliberately making a point here to show on a, almost on a human level. And of course, Abraham is called the friend of God. But uh, uh, the, the question does arise, why did Abraham stop at 10? Why didn't he actually continue and ask for maybe nine or eight or seven or six or five or four or three or two or one? Not sure. But um, what we do see, everyone, is that God demonstrates an immense willingness to show grace. Every time Abraham uh, got him down and more and more, uh, God showed willingness. And every request that Abraham asked, God states that he will grant it. So not sure what conclusions to draw uh, from this. Uh, but one thing for sure is the sins of Sodom and Gomorrah had come up before the Lord. Number two, but in, in Abraham's prayer, it's almost like I've got it in my notes here. Uh, he's got a, a balance or a mixture between boldness and yet humility. You know, he has this radical boldness to keep going back to the Lord and keep going back. And yet he kept this humility and he had a persistence in prayer. He didn't give up. He didn't stop. And some people would say he had an audacity in praying, a chutzpah 
so to speak. Um, I'm really, really curious to know why he didn't continue. But it, it, uh, but what's what is really interesting, everyone, is the fact that the Lord takes Abraham into his confidence. It's an indication that he now elicits the prayer from Abraham. What am I? What do I mean? It's almost like the fact that God chose Abraham out of the Ur of the Chaldees, this new, this new humanity, if I can use the term. Remember, humanity was destroyed by the flood. Then humanity was spread at the Tower of Babel. And now a new sense of humanity, the choosing of a man, pouring out his blessing and bringing Abraham into his confidence it almost it's like part of that confidence is he's eliciting prayer he wants abraham to kind of give him something back here so th there's a responsibility in in abraham's lap here and in fact look at verse uh, chapter 19 verse 7 uh, verse 27 <coughs> and <coughs> and abraham got up early in the morning to the place where he stood before the Lord. So he went back, everyone. He went back to where he was and he looked towards Sodom. In other words, he prayed and he didn't rest. This is what I call follow up. Follow up. He did the praying, but he didn't leave it at that. It's, it's almost like have you ever prayed for someone? Have you ever said, we'll pray for someone? And then have you ever just forgotten them or have you followed up? Have you ever thought like a week or even the next day, I wonder how they are and you have followed up on them, how, what a blessing it is to them and what a blessing it is to you. It shows the other person, it shows you that you care. And this is, this is showing that Abraham has the burden on his heart here, the burden of the Lord. Abraham got up early in the morning to the place where he stood before the Lord and he looked towards Sodom and Gomorrah and toward all the land of the plain and behold, and beheld, and lo, the smoke of the country went up as the smoke of a furnace. And it came to pass when God destroyed the cities of the plain that God remembered Abraham and sent Lot out of the midst of the overthrow when he overthrew the cities in which Lot dwelt. <coughs> there's, not, there's nothing that Abraham could have done here. He did the hard work, everyone, and the hard work was prayer. Now, now it's all in the Lord's hands. Okay. And, that, and I think there's a good lesson there, everyone. Our, our real battle is in the, in the area of prayer. And, in, and, and, and on our knees. And then from there, we do what we can. But really, we there are some things that only the Lord can change or people can make a decision of their will. The, the people of Sodom and Gomorrah, they could have stopped uh, their wickedness. Um, but obviously they didn't. And the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. <clears throat> And by the way, we have archaeologists working in the northeastern uh, section of the Dead Sea, uh, trying to find more remains. And they found massive amounts of sulfur in the area, uh, as well as the southern part of Ain Bokek along the, uh, the Dead Sea at the northern tip of the Arava. Okay. Now we get to the, the, the biggest test probably in Abraham's uh, life, and that is the offering of Isaac, which is called the Akidah, the binding of Isaac, or as the Muslims say, the binding of Ishmael. We don't believe that. We believe that it's Isaac. So Genesis 22 verse 1, and it came to pass after these things now one question everyone after what things 
Was it after the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah? What was it after? Okay, Abraham has come along. It's like reading reading uh, the 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 autobiography or the biography rather of Abraham. We've we've come across a few chapters of his life already. Okay, one chapter is his his background and Ur. Another chapter is the big moving away, the big migration. Number three is, uh, or actually part of part of uh, number uh, two is the Lord appearing to Abraham, uh, get out of your country, out of your people. That was massive for Abraham, to, to put it lightly. Uh, then the big migration, then him coming into the land. Uh, now we read about this massive situation where God destroys a whole civilization and people. I wonder, as Abraham looked up, Obviously, Abraham knew what was going on in that city, okay? And he would have had a moral co compass. He would have known that it was pretty, pretty evil. And, uh, and then when he woke up and he saw the smoke, thinking everyone has just been consumed. Remember, we know a lot more in our 21st century than Abraham knew back then, okay? Abraham's education was very limited compared to our day we've had three and a half thousand years more history abraham's history was very very small so what he knew about god was also very limited but what he learned that morning when he woke up is this god is not someone to mess around with and he destroyed he rained down uh, uh, brimstone and fire on the city um but going back to genesis 22 let's go back to the 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 the, the narrative because something that we didn't touch on is uh it, it actually came from last week when the lord promised abraham and uh sarah a child okay we're going back to that story now, everyone, the child story and the, the whole story of Sarah laughing and uh, and all of that. And now that child has grown up. And, and, it, and it took years and years and years of waiting. That in itself was a massive testing for Abraham. And... <clears throat> Before we actually go to the text here, can can I just ask a question, everyone? What what was God trying to teach Abraham, having to wait so long? Why did the why did the process take so long? Why did did the Lord not allow Sarah to be impregnated um, in the first year after the promise? The second, the third, the fifth. Why so long? Well, uh, you know, we, we don't know the whole answers, but we can we can speculate. And one of the things that uh, Rashi and some of the, the great rabbis say is um, not only was it to, te to teach Abraham perseverance and persistence, but actually to teach abraham about failure a sense not not that he was a failure but in his efforts and in sarah's efforts uh they were doing all they can but nothing was happening and um the frustration of it the 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 the, the questioning god about it the unfairness You've promised it, but it's not many, many things. But but the the issue of failure is an interesting one. That um, you know that especially if you live a good moral upright life, you're doing all you can in life, and it seems that it's not working out for you, at least from your perspective. Um, 
maybe we can pick up more on that when we talk later. But going back now to uh, page four, and it came to pass over these things that God did test Abraham and said to him, Abraham, and he said, Behold, here am I. Veomer Hineni. Hineni means here am I. And he said, Take now your son, your only son, Isaac, whom thou lovest, and get thee unto the land of Moriah and offer him there for a burnt offering upon one of the mountains, which I will tell of thee. So he doesn't tell him where. He just tells him to offer him up. Okay, now there's a lot. This is a massive story and so many different angles to talk about it. I think, and going back to uh, verse one, where it says, after these things, after these things, and, I, and I, I started to go there, but I got sidetracked. The way mankind and humanity was treated had become so debaucherous that in those days, children, humans, but children were not highly respected. Children were considered property of the parents. Parents owned their children. That is wrong. According to true Judaism, that is wrong. And doesn't that creep into our society, everyone? Do we feel at times that we own our children? It's not how it should be. It couldn't be further from the truth. We, we, are, uh, um, we are caretakers and we are vessels, physical vessels, to bring children into the world, but we do not own them by any means. They belong to the Lord. So, uh, God is asking for Abraham's child. The child doesn't belong to Abraham. The child belongs to the Lord. Um, so, again, going back to after these things, when Civilization had become so bad that the respect for, for humanity was so low. And actually, if you do a study of different civilizations, it's, it's terrible. I mean, even going back to the Romans, where they used to use humans for sport, and the Greeks, they used to find ways of torturing along with the Assyrians, 1,300 different uh, uh inventions of how to torture your enemies uh again it was a sport uh, when the roman soldiers returned home and found that they only had a daughter and not a son they would throw the the daughters away in, in the garbage can so um you know the value for human life uh, was very low uh and and now according to the rabbis the sages this is going to be a pivotal moment in the history of humanity, not just for Abraham, but for humanity. And remember everyone, the other thing is that there were ch uh, child sacrifices. Uh, why child sacrifices? Because people believed that giving the fruit of my womb was the greatest thing I can do to my God. They didn't care about the children. They just cared about them pleasing their God. So it was kind of a, um, a perverted or a twisted, warped way of looking at it. But um, here's the question, everyone. Again, and I asked it earlier. I asked it in the light of Abraham and Sarah having to wait so long for their child. But the same question is relevant for right here. Why did the Lord put Abraham to the test here? Uh, you know, was it to be a testimony to Isaac, his son? Was part of the test so that Isaac, his son, could see how submissive his father was to his God? 
and the testimony that he would be to uh, Isaac would really make an impact to him? Maybe. Or, or what about the, uh, and, and fact, in fact, maybe it was part of the answer because Isaac also was very submissive in this. Isaac could have actually been rebellion, rebellious and resisted and, um, you know, uh, and thought, I'm not going to go ahead and, and, and get killed on the altar, which makes us question why, uh, what was it in Isaac that, that how could he be so submissive? Um, maybe he didn't know uh, the whole story, what was going to befall him. Although, you know, uh, uh, when he gets to the, the altar, it seems he does know. Okay. Um, another reason why the Lord testing Abraham here, maybe, maybe to strip Abraham from being too close to Isaac. And what do I mean by that? Remember the Lord said to Abraham, Abraham, in your seed, all the nations will be blessed. Okay. They waited and waited and waited for that child. They tried, they tried, they tried, nothing happened. Then they tried. Remember, Sarah said, go and sleep with Hagar. Abraham slept. They had Ishmael. They realized that was a disaster. That wasn't the answer. So finally, they get the child. Wow, God, you're amazing. You broke through. You came through. They were so excited. Um, and maybe uh, Abraham got a little bit too close to Isaac. And I, I don't know. I'm just trying to speculate that maybe uh, Isaac had become a little bit of an idol to him. I don't know. And, uh, uh, and, and it's on the topic of what I was talking about before. Children don't belong to their parents. <laughs> <coughs> or, <coughs> or, ladies and gentlemen, maybe the reason why the Lord tested Abraham Maybe it was for Abraham's sake. What do I mean? Think about Abraham. The morning it happens, he gets up, he gets the wood. It's a long journey. It's a three-day journey. What did Abraham go through those three days? It must have been agonizing. It must have been like a slow death. And he did it. He made it all the way. He looked at his beloved son, the one in whom all those promises, and he got to the place where he took the knife. And when he got to that place, the Lord said, stop. Now I know you fear me. And maybe it was to show Abraham, Abraham, you are an amazing man. Abraham, maybe you didn't realize you had it in you. I knew you had it in you. You didn't know. I wanted to test you to show you. Now I know for sure that you fear me. And maybe the Lord threw. Almost like an, you know, they say when um, a mother eagle, what does she do to teach the children how to fly? It, the mother throws its little, what are they called, eaglets, out of its nest. And the poor little eaglet is like, it's never flown. And he, out of panic, the eaglet flaps its wings. And that's how it, le uh, uh, it uh, learns to fly. And, uh, and the, that li those little eaglets, they don't know that they have that capacity. But there you go. Uh, and maybe there's something about that, everyone that now Abraham, he's sitting down after that angel appears to him and he's hearing those words, now I know you fear me. And that's not all he heard, everyone, because if you go to chapter 22, verse 11, uh, let's read it. He said, uh, oh, verse 12, 
He said, lay not your hand upon the lad, neither do anything unto him. For now I know that you fear a God, seeing you have not withheld your son, your only son from me. And Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, behind him, a ram caught in a thicket by his horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered him up for a burnt offering in the stead of his son. And Abraham called the name of that place Jehovah Jireh. Now, this is the fourth name so far and we're only in chapter 18 of genesis this is the fourth name of god that's been revealed first there's elohim which is a general name of god then there is yahweh which is the lord or adonai which is a very personal name of god last week we spoke about el shaddai el shaddai is from the hebrew word shad which means a breast where the baby gets nourished, gets all its comfort and nourishment from, the all comforting and the all providing God. And now we have Jehovah Jireh, which in Hebrew is Jehovah or Adonai Yireh. And it literally means the Lord will see to it. And that's why it says, it is said to this day, in the mount of the Lord, it shall be seen. Or the, Really, it means the Lord will see to it. The Lord will take care. That's the name of my God. He will take care of it. He will oversee it. He will make sure it works out. And now, look what happens in verse 15. And the angel of the Lord called unto Abraham out of it, the heaven the second time and said, and look at the strong words, everyone. By myself have I sworn. By myself I have sworn. Remember, everyone, in the Bible, you needed two or three witnesses to establish something. God is saying, by myself I have sworn, says the Lord, for because you have done this thing and you have not withheld your son, your only son, that in blessing I will bless you. And in multiplying, I will multiply thy seed as the stars of the heaven and as the sand which is upon the seashore. And thy seed shall possess the gates of the enemies. And in thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed because thou hast obeyed my voice. What a, a, an amazing story. Think of Abraham now after he, uh, at the end of that day, at the end of that uh, the day, Abraham's probably sitting thinking, oh, that was a tough day at the office. <laughs> you know, I had to go through what I did those last three days and him sitting in his tent by himself or sitting with Sarah <clears throat> and thinking, I did it. I passed the test. I didn't know I had the strength to do that. I didn't know I was capable of, of doing that. I wanted to actually run away from it i didn't want there were times on that three-day journey i'm sure abraham was thinking i i didn't want to go through that i was one i was second guessing whether i really heard from god or not but i guess i did and i guess i did the right thing but uh, and and we could we could go over that a, a lot but um God was pleased with him. And, uh, and in so doing, Abraham got a mass amount of blessing that came to him. He didn't hold back. He gave what the Lord called him to give up. And the Lord <coughs> does the same with every one of our lives. He doesn't always choose the same things for every person. He touches on what he wants in every one of our lives. And he asks us, are we willing? Are we, uh, uh, yeah, are we willing? Uh, sometimes we don't know if we're able, but are we at least willing to give certain things up? And, um, and it's interesting. Abraham, he knew. He knew that the Lord, he actually knew 
that uh, that God wasn't going to take Abraham. How about that? He knew, and yet he still went. He still went the course, because it says in the book of uh, uh, I think it's the book of Hebrews eleven that figuratively he knew that God was able to raise Isaac from the dead. Part of this testing, everyone, was all about shaping, not only shaping uh, Abraham's character, but shaping his destiny. Because remember, his name was changed to Avraham, uh, father of a multitude. And uh, I put on page five, just something that I found online. It says this. It says, I asked for strength. And God gave me difficulties to make me strong. And let me just stop at that, everyone. Have you ever asked God for strength? You know, if, if, if your child said, Mommy, Daddy, um, you know, I want, I'm, I'm feeling like I'm getting bullied at school. I want you to help me be strong. What would you do about it? Would you send them? to play with little babies to make them strong? No. You would send them to kids who are probably a little bit tougher than them to toughen them up. In other words, it would be difficulties. Okay? I asked for strength and God gave me difficulties to make me strong. I asked for wisdom and God gave me problems to solve. I asked for prosperity and God gave me a brain and energy to work, to dig in to the brain and energy that you have. I asked for courage and God gave me danger to overcome. That's a tough one for a lot of people. We want to be strong. We want to be courageous. And the way that we grow in the area of courage is to overcome dangers and fearful situations where we're put way out of our comfort zones. I asked for love and God gave me troubled people to help. I asked for favors and God gave me opportunities. I received nothing I wanted, but I received everything I needed. Guys, are we going to trust God that he is Jehovah Jireh, the one who will see to it, the one who knows what is best for us? Do you really know what is best for you? I don't know if I do, but I trust that God knows what is best for me, and I trust that he knows what's best for you as well. So may the Lord uh, bless us with something from this parasha, this portion, the Lord appeared to Avraham in the plains of Mamre when he was tired in the heat of the day and that opportunity rose up. Look at how he served. He, he, uh, he, he and his wife, Sarah, they put all of their emotion, all their effort into serving and helping these three strangers um, and it's it's mentioned in the bible i think it's to honor the the servitude of abraham and sarah and they're both considered by billions of people as the father and mother of hospitality and how important hospitality is everyone when you get people coming over when i come to america don't forget to get me over to exercise to see how good you are at serving. No, I'm joking. And then everyone, the way that Abraham dealt with the cry of Sodom and Gomorrah, how he took on the burden of the Lord of the day, how he became an intercessor. That's part of our call as well, everyone. We are a kingdom of priests. We are God's priests. Abraham was a priest. You don't see that name or title given to him but he was a priest and he began became an intercessor for Sodom and Gomorrah and God was willing 
to answer his prayers. And then we see uh, the, the obedience of Abraham and offering up his only begone son, the most, the things most precious to him. May we not be afraid to offer up the things most precious to us. In the words of the Lord, John 12, he who loves his life will lose it. He who loses his life for my sake will gain it. Before he said that, he said, unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it abides alone. The, the laws of seeds in the kingdom of uh, agriculture is most of the time, first, a seed has to die. It has to actually die in the ground. So, um, and guys, don't forget, don't forget, in the same light that it was God the Father, because of his love for you and I, and for anyone who's listening to this later on in recording, it says in John 3, 16, for God, the Father, Elohim, so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And he didn't hold back. He allowed his son. And the son himself also submitted to his father the same way that Isaac submitted to his father and Yeshua, Jesus himself said, I lay down my life. No man taketh it from me, but I lay it down of myself. And because of that, everyone, it says, wherefore, God has given him a name above every name when he raised him from the dead. And one day, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Yeshua, Jesus, is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, Aharon. And thank you for doing this and knowing that you don't feel well. It's a labor of love, we know. Um, well, we visited a lot of places today. We've uh, had a visitation from angels and God and destroyed a couple cities and <laughs> offered up a son. That's another huge Parsha. Um, I mean, I'll just start it yeah. off with a quick comment. In, in studying this, um, a lot of the rabbinic teachings talk about the greatest sin of Sodom and Gomorrah being one of not having hospitality. And I think you touched on that a little and that it wasn't so much the homosexuality and all of that. It was the selfishness. And um, I guess there's some sayings that in Sodom, like if you didn't have money and wealth, you couldn't even come into the city that they didn't want you they didn't want to help you they were not hospitable at all and it is interesting even though that's not a in the bible um right before this abraham gets these visits right from these angels and shows all this hospitality right before the destruction of sodom and gomorrah so um i think he's just showing us how important hospitality is and you know, here it's difficult. Everybody's got fences, sure. but over in Israel, I mean, they're very hospitable. You know, it's all, it's kind of like in India, it's all out in the open and, oh, come on in and have a meal. There's always enough food for everybody, you know? Um, so I think the Lord's just telling us that's extremely important to be hospitable to people. So next time I'm on you come, you amen. need to Yes. Because <laughs> oh, yes. I did invite you. You got it. I'm just reminding yeah. Yeah, you. you did. You <laughs> did. I, you're right. I'm just teasing. So anyone that has a comment, Sorry. please unmute yourself and I'll be sending out the chat notes as well. So if you didn't get a chance to read those. Yeah. Yeah. Hi all. Um, yeah. Aaron, uh, just right near the end, it was interesting when you said things like with the trials and tribulations God put Abraham through, like you said, something about, um, you know, to gain wisdom, for example, you know, we put you through difficulties. Um, yeah, the conclusion there, I found I found that like all very interesting. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. like give me problems, give me wisdom, give me problems to solve, you know, to overcome dangers. Yeah. 
like you said, put the people out of their comfort zone. And that's what I think God was doing, you know, for Abraham, wasn't he? Yeah. 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 Amen. Thanks, Vince. Thank you. Good yeah. to have you back, brother. Yeah. Oh, good. Yes, you too. Yeah. Yeah. It's been a while. Um, and I, I, I just also did find, I did a quick internet search. I did find such a nature magazine about, I think, that archaeological find in the northeast of the Dead Sea. Um, where the, anyway, they're open to the idea that that could possibly have been uh, a sudden, um, probably it's destruction by a cosmic burst. This is something like the Tunguska event. Um, yeah. Which I, um, uh, anyway, I left that link. I left that link to it in the uh, in the chat. Yeah, that's good idea, Vance. Good idea. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Thanks, brother. I'm curious about. Yeah, right, you're welcome. Say um that things are being found in the north end of the dead sea do you mean outside of the dead sea or as the dead sea is receding are they finding things revealed? i think actually i think it was uh, according to the photo that i that i that i found um in this uh, given in the article it's actually just um north it's just northeast yeah it's just to the northeast of the dead sea it goes by the name of tal el ha Hamam, Hamam, Tal El Hamam. I might just be able to, I might be able to just, that's what they're, anyway, they're, that's what they're calling it. Um, and they're open to the, they don't say definitively, but they're quite open to the idea that it could have been, that it could have been, um, that it could have been uh, Sodom. Yeah, I've just said, yeah, oh, hang on, Tal. Uh, it's it's straight east of Jericho, about four miles, and um, we stopped around my tour this last year in May. Yeah, but again, it's okay. there's still some archaeologists that have worked there that debate it yet. Yeah, it's a debate, but anyway, it, it nevertheless, you know, it's um, I'm always into history and and so forth, so it's it's yeah, it's it's intriguing to say the least. Yeah. Well, and I'm always curious as, you know, I know it's startling to see things receding and drying up, but I'm always curious, like, oh, what's, what's under there? <laughs> yeah. You know, what might we find? Right. You should yeah. go on one of those archaeological digs. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there, the, well, that, that's what it is. Yeah, it's an, it is, it is an um, archaeological dig. Yeah. Yeah. Well, let's, let's, give let's move map on. To, let's yeah, let's we'll move, move on, on that from thing. that. But the, the one thing I want to add is, sadly, in Israel today, you can actually come on hundreds of different flavored tours. But one tour is an LGBT tour where huh. that area is actually one of the key areas that they take you to. So, but anyway, next question, please. <laughs> Oh, yeah. Hi, this is Kara. Hey, Kara. Shabbat shalom. Shabbat shalom. Um, so I just have a couple of thoughts. I, first of all, thank you for the teaching. That was really encouraging. And I just think there's so much application here to our lives. Um, how God called Abraham out and gave him this new identity. And we saw how he was interceding for the people of Sodom and Gomorrah. And, um, you know, God in 1 Peter 2, 9, he says that we are a kingdom of priests um, and his own special people. And so I just think for us, it's so important to discover our identity in Christ, like Abraham did, how we um, are supposed to be interceding for people. We are a kingdom of priests, and God has promised that uh, he's going to give us the kingdom uh, in places like Daniel 7 and Revelation. And uh, this identity is so important. And also in Galatians 3, it, it talks about how we who have faith in Christ are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. And we think about the promises that God gave to Abraham about um, giving him land and blessing and descendants. And God has promised that to us too, spiritually speaking. You know, we have um, 
eternal life and the new Jerusalem that God has promised to us. And he's blessed us with everything that we need in this life. And he's also promised us spiritual descendants. So there's a war going on for the souls of people right now. <coughs> But our job is to be intercessors and to engage in that war. And God has promised us descendants too. Uh, so I just, this whole story of Abraham is so encouraging to me. And then wow. uh, one, one other thing, um, with God calling Abraham his friend, and then God testing Abraham and calling him to offer up Isaac, it's amazing to think about um, you know, what do friends do? They, they know each other. They go through things together. They bear one another's burden. God was allowing Abraham to get a little taste of what God himself was going to have to go through. And so I think that wow. helps us have a whole new perspective on suffering. God allows us to enter into his suffering with him because he wants us to be his friends. And so, yeah, just really encouraging. And, and thank you for the teaching this morning. Yeah. Hey, Amen. Yeah. yeah, you're welcome. Thank you for that. Those insights, Kara. That is like very precious and very deep. Thank you. And, and to add what Kara said, just let me just mention that uh, Genesis 22, the binding of Isaac, is in the Torah portion also a foreshadow of God the Father sacrificing His own Son, who in hindsight turns out to be that Lamb that Abraham told Isaac about. He said, "My Son, God will provide Himself a Lamb for a burnt offering." For shadow of Yeshua, as Kara said. Yes. Amen. Definitely. I don't know what the protocol is on here. I had my hand raised. So is that, I don't know, I'm going to put it down, but um, I just wanted to make a comment of how I'm applying this today. Um, today, there's a young man who's going to be coming to my house to ask me a very important question. My husband and I expect that this will be the question. He wants to uh, uh, probably ask for my daughter's hand in marriage. So Aharon, your, your pep talk about laying down our Isaacs is very appropriate today. And so um, while you were speaking, I was kind of turning your words into a prayer which I won't take the time to read. Everybody heard your words and I'm so grateful for that, but I could not have started out with you guys on a more perfect day. Um, you said um, we don't own our children and we've taken our children and placed them in the arms of the pastor and asked them to bless them, right? Um, we dedicated them in some way. And so uh, today is another dedication day for, for me and my husband. We have children of promise, right? We, we see the dreams that God has placed them in, in our Isaacs. And I, in the, in my case, um, God has given both me and my daughter, uh, dreams, literal, you know, sleep, sleep time dreams about, um, you know, a young man, a different young man, uh, that, uh, we thought was going to be in her pathway. And so today is a real day of laying down both the child and the child of promise and the dreams that we wow. have. Um, it, um, so I'm just saying God sees and somehow he will provide somehow, yeah. um, his revelation, um, that he showed us, I trust him um to 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 make to work all these things out in a way that i can't know or understand so i'm a little bit of sarah today i'm not going to start yeah. getting into it I'm doing it my way <laughs> with my concubine so <laughs> and the other thing is um so to speak uh in these days uh, we have to clarify uh, comments like that don't we um um but also uh, I love this part. It says your descendants in Genesis 22, 17 and 18, your descendants shall possess the cities of their enemies. And my other um, season that I'm going through is that both of my children have chosen to live in these places, which will grow their character and test them. Uh, as you were talking about, Aharon. one is in near DC and the other one wants to move to Los Angeles. And so um, be in the film industry. And so again, um, you know, laying down the, the, the children, laying down my desires and dreams to protect them, right? 
and knowing that uh, not only God is going to give them uh, the gates of their enemies because they too are children of Abraham, but they will bless the nations there and they will bring the keys of the kingdom to open the gates um, of God's reign on earth in their vocation, in their land. So thank you for letting me share that little testimony today. Teresa, thank yeah. you for sharing thank you. such personal, deep stuff. And uh, wow, that is, I, I can see how today's passage really spoke into your situation, the timing of it. That is amazing. Thank you for sharing. And um, may it go well today. May you have peace. May you have blessing. And, uh, and that's the other thing that the Lord said to Abraham after he laid it down. And blessing, I will bless you. And, and exactly, the Lord will see to it no matter what. Um, and so, um, yeah, and, may, and as we say, uh, 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 when we bless in the Jewish world, we say, may you live to dance at your grandchildren's wedding. Uh, yes i receive that thank you <laughs> oh man hey aaron there's a question in chat from uh kelly asking uh if 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 uh regarding the trials of our lives if it relates to how john the baptist said that yeshua would baptize us in the spirit and fire like the trials are our fire to purify us to make us into his image yeah i guess i guess that's part of it a baptism of fire a baptism of purity of holiness uh sanctification all of that yeah and um i uh i wish that we could live in that in that fire i'm not going to pray it but um yeah. <laughs> because we all know that it's a cost we all know that it's a cost but uh, may the Lord give us the grace to uh, to do what we need to do. Amen. Yeah. Is there anybody else? Mm. It's about 45 after. Aaron, I want to be respectful Aaron. of your time, Aaron. Aaron That's fine. Mentioned. I'm good. Okay. Aaron, you, you, mentioned, yeah. you mentioned about strength, wisdom, prosperity, courage, love, and favors. Have you ever asked for patience? <laughs> I know I'm um, going to do that. <laughs> we quit doing that a long time ago. <laughs> only once. Well, I I went. To, <laughs> I agree. Yeah, only once. No, I I I went to um I went to a psycho psychiatrist once to ask him <laughs> to help me um grow in patience, and I was in his waiting room and. And I had to wait and wait and wait, and I grew impatient, so I left. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's a good one. Hey. Hey. <laughs> well, would uh, you like to close us in prayer, uh -huh. Sure, yeah. <clears throat> Let's do that, everyone. Let you get ready. Hallelujah. Father, Heavenly Father, thank you for this word. May it sink into us. May we find grace, Lord, in whatever we are challenged with. May we find courage. May we find strength. May we find uh, those times like when we're sitting in our tents and we're tired and it's hot and the, the phone uh, calls or we get a text or a, a situation arises, Lord, may we rise up knowing, Lord, just like Abraham, that you were the ultimate servant, Lord, that you came not to be served, but to serve and to give your life as a ransom for many. Thank you, Lord, for your word. It is amazing. We've always got so many things to learn from it and how it speaks into our lives lord i pray your blessing on every one of us here thank you lord we love you we thank you that you have sent your, your son for us you did not lay you did not hold your <coughs> your hand back lord but you allowed him to be handed over and crucified for us and we just forever grateful and may we um 
may we serve you as appreciation for uh, your your love towards us gary <laughs> The Briute, brother, the Briute. Thank you. Um, just want to mention real quick that uh, a, a lot of people I've talked to, and not people here on this call, but people I've talked to, often get a sense that the church it sees itself as a totally separate entity from Israel in God's sight. Yet born-again believers who are, non, uh, who are non-Jews, Gentiles, as well as believing Jews, are grafted into Israel's cultivated olive tree. And keep in mind, and this is for everybody, Gentile believers are now a part of the commonwealth of Israel. I think that's very, that's very, very important to share that they need to. Oh, amen. Mm-hmm. So, um, so real quick, and then I'll close. It says, I, I just yeah. want to say, let us not nullify the promises of God in our own lives. You want to believe, but be fully convinced that God will bring forth his promises, even those that seem not only likely, but absurd in, in his appointed time in his Moed. And Romans 4 says, Abraham did not waver at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strengthened in faith giving glory to God and being fully convinced that what he had promised, he was also able to perform. Amen for that. So if you can please all unmute. Amen. And I uh, will give the blessing of the Lord. Receive his blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his counts upon all of you and fill you with his shalom, with his peace. B'shem Adonai Yeshua Mashiach. In the name of our Lord, Jesus the Messiah. Adonai our Lord, Moshe'enu our Redeemer. Tell Yoetz, wonderful counselor. El Gibor, mighty God. Aviad, everlasting father. And Sar Shalom, the prince of everlasting peace. And all of God's people said, Amen. 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 Thank you, Gary. Thank you. Thank you, Gary. Thanks, Aaron. Thank you. We'll keep praying. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Shabbat shalom. Shabbat shalom. Shabbat shalom. Shabbat shalom. I hope you Shavuot all come back. Shavuot tov, brother. Shavuot tov. Lehitraot. Lehitraot. Bye. Thank <laughs> you.